When I was about five years old, my mother bought me a book called All the Colors of the Earth. And upon opening it, I realized it was unlike any other one I'd ever read before because it was filled with children of a range of different colors. The author, Sheila Hamanaka, described children in the roaring browns of bears and soaring eagles, the whispering golds of late summer grasses, and the crackling russets of fallen leaves, the tinkling pinks of tiny seashells by the rumbling sea. Hearing this little excerpt even now, I still remember the warm feeling it filled me with 10 years ago, and the joy I felt to see a brown girl on paper. When I was seven, I remember running to my mother, crying and demanding to know why she and my father had given me my name, Riti. I told her I wanted to change it immediately. She looked at me puzzled at first before humoring me and asking me why that was. To be honest, I hadn't expected to get that far, so I just broke down further into a sobbing, wailing, and tearful mess while she comforted me, still confused by this emotional inquiry. I didn't know how to tell her that I wanted to change more than just my name, but also my skin, my hair, my eyes, my culture, my everything. You see, I wanted to be an Ashley or an Emily, with fair skin and blonde hair and blue eyes, not a Riti, with brown skin and brown hair and brown eyes. I felt disgusted that I felt this way, but I also felt disgusted to be within my own body, unseen in the books I read and the TV shows I watched. I was jealous of some of my friends who did have somebody who looked like them. So when we played make-believe or joked about who we wanted to be when we were older, they always had a character or an answer. Eventually, I brushed my feelings off and I told my mother I didn't want to talk about it again. And she understood. She had bought me that book, All the Colors of the Earth, two years prior because she knew how much I struggled with my color. But despite her best efforts, that feeling of unimportance, of being a brown wilted leaf amongst fresh greens, that didn't go away. Now, eight years later, I'm here to talk to you about the power of racial representation and why it still matters. Because I know I'm not the only child who felt inadequate who felt that they didn't meet the Caucasian ideal presented to us in our media. I also know that I'm not the only person waiting for the day when my generation won't have to run down to the local mall to pick up a picture book just so their five-year-old can feel accepted. So let's begin by talking about one of the most commonly used words nowadays, diversity. I'll admit, it has gotten better in recent years with films like Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians and verbal outrage where such representation has failed to manifest. Netflix, now one of the largest streaming services available, has been pushing through diversity, calling for actors of various ethnic backgrounds to frontline TV shows and movies to convey the stories of people of color. Minorities are also steadily surging into cinemas at a higher rate than ever historically recorded before, with 54% of the audience of Avengers Endgame one of the largest blockbuster films in recent years, being made up of people of color. It feels like we're finally on the path to, towards seeing non-white folk on the screen as a norm rather than a spectacle. However, it is far more difficult to cleanse an industry notorious for its flawless execution of racism through stereotyping and job exclusion behind the scenes than one might think. And these small strides towards diversity they shouldn't be mistaken for the bigger victory of equal racial representation. In fact, to better illustrate this for you, I just want to share a few statistics. In 2019, 27.6% of lead actors in Hollywood were people of color, a 1% increase to 2018, whilst 15.1% of all movie directors were minorities, a 4.2% decrease to the previous year. Diverse movie writers also covered a measly population of 13.9%. So better? Sure, sometimes. But perfect? Hardly. A major reason for this stifled growth is a lack of understanding on what racial representation is and why it matters in the first place. Often, representation is confused with having a single Black, Asian, or Latino, or non-white character, 
and an otherwise completely Caucasian cast. They're solely for comic relief or to convey a false sense of diversity. You know what I'm talking about. We've all seen it. These token characters have personalities built on stereotypes and are there for the rare, difficult conversations about discrimination, as a love interest, antagonist, or for humor reasons, as the main character's best bud. They don't get the limelight. They just tick the box. And of course, racial representation is not perpetuating stereotypes and expressing a race or ethnic group how it's assumed to be. Most of all, it is not Caucasian erasure. It is, however, the equal representation of various racial and ethnic groups with accurate research and understanding. Now, a few of you might be thinking, what's the big deal? We do have representation. Why aren't you talking about that? Well, I agree. But first, let's dissect that a bit. For over a century, minorities and people of color have been victim to the media's belittling and demeaning portrayal of their people. They have watched as an industry profited off of age-old stereotypes and perceptions to garner larger audiences, often at the expense of people of color and their actors. Our writers, directors, and artists are silenced and locked out of decision-making rooms. Our stories diluted and manipulated to create a norm, which we all blindly follow. Consequently, what we see is often a caricature of our cultures on screen. We get stereotypes like the dragon lady or tiger mom, the overly sexual Latino or the sassy black woman. We see tropes like the white male savior, a narrative based on a white man who, upon recognizing the peril of people of color caused by racism and discrimination, saves them, which in reality is simply an extension of colonialism and narcissism, exploiting the struggles of minorities and people of color for a touching redemption arc. We don't get accurate representation. Instead, we see people that look like us on screen but people that we can't fully identify with because they're interpreted through a whitewash filter over the camera lens, somebody else's lens. This creates a confusing relationship in which we're expected to be grateful to be seen, but we don't understand what we're seeing. Or, first of all, we don't even get this representation in the first place and our characters are never written or they're erased. Take Scarlett Johansson's role in the movie The Ghost in the Shell, for example, which was originally written for an Asian woman, but was whitewashed. Look at the fictional character of Al Harrison in the non-fictional movie Hidden Figures, which told the story of Katherine Johnson, a black woman and the NASA rocket launch, who was there solely for his white male savior narrative. Internalized racism and prejudices continue to be seen throughout the fabric of what makes Hollywood. You can see it in characters like Baljeet from Phineas and Ferb, Ravi from Jesse, Apu from The Simpsons, or Gloria from Modern Family. And unfortunately, these stereotypes don't only stay on screen disguised as entertainment. They venture further into our lives, our work, into our world. So let's talk through these impacts a bit by looking at the following articles from the same journalist published within a day of one another about two different groups who committed the same crime. When the news agency was questioned for their decision to obtain graduation photos for the Caucasian men you see on screen here, but mugshots for the African-American men, they defended themselves saying that they needed to put in a formal request to get mugshots. However, in doing so, they overlooked their decisions to perpetuate the stereotype of black men being immediately guilty in the crimes that they're accused of. This is evidence of a subtle racial bias that manifests without an individual's knowledge, without the individual recognizing the gravity of their actions. Of course, the criminalization of black men and women seen in the media and news goes further 
then only with black people. Internalized racism and prejudice continues on for other minorities and racial groups. And this impacts everything from the very way that we interact with one another. So let me lay out these impacts for you in a more clear manner. In our legal systems, people of color are five times more likely to be convicted of longer sentences for the exact same crimes. A study conducted by the Running Maid Trust and the University of Greenwich also found that Black and Muslim inmates are consistently treated worse within prisons. Police, as we see nowadays, are able to act as judge, jury, and executioner before their suspects, sometimes the innocent, and mostly people of color, are able to say their case. In the world of economics and finance, children of color are more likely to be of lower socioeconomic statuses by the time they are adults, even if they do start from the same financial status as their Caucasian counterparts, caused by racially biased hiring and policing. Another study found that minorities who whiten their resumes, removing any racial cues or cultural hints, got nearly twice as many callbacks for interviews. In the world of residency and healthcare, minorities are affected by residential housing segregation and are more likely to live in densely populated areas that are farther away from basic facilities, such as medical care facilities, grocery stores, and pharmacies making it more difficult for them to obtain their most basic needs. People of color are also more likely to not have insurance coverage, adequate pay, sick leave, insur um, as mentioned insurance, and a variety of other factors that impact their day-to-day -day lives. This has become increasingly apparent with the pandemic and COVID-19, as studies have found that people of color are disproportionately affected by what our world is facing making up more of the severe outcome cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Finally, in pop culture and media, we see the cultures of non-white folk being appropriated for beauty purposes or aesthetics. Just take the fox eye trend or the trend of darkening your skin, wearing large hoops, dreadlocks, fox braids, bindis to Coachella or Native American feathers. Hairstyles, jewelry, and clothing garments that were previously deemed too ghetto, too weird, or too exotic are now being reappropriated for white audiences and portrayed as trendy, cool, and the next big thing. What began as appreciation has quickly shifted towards cultural appropriation and erasure. And arguably the worst impact of all, which affects everybody listening to this, whether as a parent, child or teacher is how racial stereotyping and prejudice seen through our media affects children. A study conducted in communication research that surveyed over 400 children found that white boys are more likely to develop higher self-esteem as compared to children of different races or girls. This is a result of gender and racial practices conducted by Hollywood and the media as a whole in which Caucasian men are conveyed as heroes, whilst other groups are pushed aside as antagonists, sexual interests, side characters, or simply unimportant. Furthermore, these impacts, they don't only stay on screen. As mentioned, they affect everything down to how we interact with one another. As put by Nancy Wang Yuan, who wrote Real Inequality, Hollywood Actors and Racism, this is dangerous because when there's a lack of racial representation, people tend to rely on media stereotypes to formulate their opinions about people outside of their own race. And when these stereotypes are damaging or inaccurate, this changes the way that we interact with one another as a whole. Today, when the conversation about anti-racism and activism is more poignant than ever, we need to pause and consider what cues we're taking in from our media. Because unfortunately, prejudices and biases are all around us. In Asia, we may think that we are excluded from the narrative of racism that we see across the Western world, particularly in the United States, but we are not, for it is in the very media that we see all around us. 
we cannot stay silent and oblivious. And we need to start noticing what we're reading, what we're watching, and what we're taking in. So speak up. Thank you.